Thank you, Archbishop. Good morning, everyone. The Lord be with us today. Yeah. Are you in particular? The Lord be with you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Everything we've learned, everything we've heard, all the promises the Lord has revealed, everything be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Yeah. You'll be standing on the promises. Amen. You will not see it in the premise of problem. Amen. 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 And the promises will work wonders in your life every time. Amen. At every crossroad. Amen. In every situation. Amen. And the Lord will perfect everything concerning you. Amen. And your family. And your ministry Amen. and all our churches. Amen. Father, we thank you once again today. We bless your name because you brought us for a good thing to charge our batteries, to sharpen our swords, and then to give us a sharp revelation of your truth so that as your word enters, and the ministry is broadened the strength, the power to carry on your grant, everyone. Amen. Every sister, every brother, Amen. every lady minister, Amen. every minister, man, Lord, I pray that your power will increase in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Use us to your glory. This is our hour. And this is our generation. Angels cannot do it for us. Paul, Peter, those who have gone cannot come back and do it. We are the men and the women of the hour. I will pray everything we need, grant to everyone. Confirm your blessing on every one of us. In Jesus' name. We pray. Yeah. You are blessed already. Please sit down in the blessing of the Lord. This morning we are bringing to conclusion our series of studies in chapter 1 of Joshua. And today, now we are looking at Joshua chapter 1, reading from verse 6 all through to verse 9. It says in verse 6, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Then in verse 7, it says, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee turn not from me to the right hand or to the left hand that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Your time to prosper has come. Amen. Verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but shalt thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, have not I commanded thee, be strong, and of a good courage, 
Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. A better amen. amen. As we have read those verses of scripture, you will notice in verse 6, in verse 7, in verse 9, it says, Be strong and be of good courage. Courage appears there in that short passage one, two, three times. We need courage even to get saved, to turn away from sin, and to distinguish yourself and come out of the crowd and to identify and stand stand with the lord stand for the lord and stand by the lord by the grace he has given he needs courage for you to separate yourself from society the society of sinners for you to separate yourself from the old friends and the old habits and to say i am now in christ a new creature in christ all things are passed away all things become new it takes courage courage after you are saved to live out the life and for people watching you and looking at your life and saying what has he got on him what has he joined is not joined anything but the god of heaven has taken hold of his life he has become somebody different from the sinful society and for you to stand and maintain that it takes courage for you now to go forward and understand that what many other people shy away from what other people try to dodge and they just say we're saved we're saved for you to understand there is something that christ has provided on the cross of calvary salvation yes sanctification that holiness without which no man shall see the lord when everybody say mm -hmm, we're here holy holy perfect perfect and yet for you to stand and to understand that without holiness no man shall see the lord and whatever the ridicule and whatever the jesting and whatever the persecution for you not only to stand on it as a doctrine to leave it out and say christ died for me so that he'll purge me he'll purify me he'll sanctify me make me holy and you live that life that life of holiness that takes courage and for you now to move on and understand that the power we saw in the early church it says afterwards in the last days i will pour out my spirit upon all flesh whatever the denomination and whatever the leaning and whatever church you are attached to for you to understand that john said i indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is higher is greater is mightier than i he will baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire and for you to have that power fire fire power inside you burning every time and to move ahead and to do what the lord has called you to do it takes courage you know it doesn't take courage to float like dead fish on the river it doesn't take courage to go along with the crowd and to say what they say to stand where they stand and only to parrot what they say and you cannot fly up go up like an eagle that doesn't take any courage for you to you know um, kind of bow your head and move on and you don't make any mark and there's no difference you're like the rest of them and calvary doesn't make any definite mark in your life that doesn't take courage but a person that will stand 
a person that will stand amid the people of God, the children of Israel, and look at Canaan land ahead and say, come on, we are going there. And we're going to take the land that takes courage. And that is what the Lord will do in your life. Amen. The courage to stand. And the courage to preach. And the courage to put line upon line, precept upon precept, and say, people of God, the Lord has commissioned us. Let's go ahead and take the land. I pray God will grant us, grant you, grant me, every one of us, that courage in Jesus' name. Amen. It even takes courage to say amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. Now today we're looking at divine blueprint for a triumphant ministry. I'm talking to triumphant ministers here today. You will triumph. You will overcome. This is not the day when we'll be like amphibians, no strength, no energy, no backbone, and uh, you know, we're anemic. This is not the day. This is the day where the minister of God will look at the word of God, will embrace the word of God, the entire word of God, will live by that word, and will move on without fear, without doubting, without wavering without dismay and he will say I stand for Christ everywhere you go the power the unction and the anointing to stand for Christ you will have in Jesus name we're dividing the message to three parts number one we're looking at number one here is the indispensable courage for lifted like breaching ministry if your ministry is going to be lifted up and is going to liberate people we need courage it's indispensable you cannot do without it courage in prayer that you are praying you're not praying the prayer that god I know that, you know, the people I'm supposed to minister to in this local government, in this uh, territory, in this state, in this nation, and, uh, things are very difficult. I don't know even how I would have the stamina to stand. You have to be courageous in prayer to claim the promises of God. These are common promises and these are limited promises. You must be courageous in prayer. If you are courageous in prayer, you are courageous in the private, in your private life. In everything you do, everywhere you go, you have conviction. And you live by that conviction no matter who agrees with you, who agrees not with you. You have courage in the private. You have courage in the public. Maybe you're a professional and then you know the way that is right, but you know the way that the rest of the people in our community and country, you know the way they're going. And for you in the public, in public service, for you to do something that they will understand and you become the conscience of the people around you. They, they measure their lifestyle with the life you live. For you to be the conscience of the community and the conscience of the country and the conscience of the professionals around you. It takes courage and for you to come to the pulpit in prayer courage in the private courage in the public courage on the pulpit for you to de de describe and for you to say thus says the word of the lord that takes courage that's why it's so important that we have indispensable courage for the people who are going to liberate for life and that's their ministry number two is the implicit commitment to his lasting message that, that you know that Christ is the final word to humanity. He gave Moses the word, the law, and then Joshua took it up, and then comes all the prophets and all the kings, but the last word, the Father in heaven said, I'll put my word in his mouth, 
and he will tell them. Hebrews tells us that in those days he revealed himself in diverse ways by to the fathers. But now he has given us his only begotten son and the final word is in his mouth. And for you to be able to declare that, you have to be committed to the lasting message of the Messiah. Number three is invisible conquest through loyal manliness. Manliness that your heart backbone and your feet are like brass and you stand there and you have the eyes of the eagle and you are able to see here is the way and here is what God wants done you become invincible unconquerable unstoppable unbeatable unbendable in our lives if we're going to do anything anything substantial anything successful anything supernatural anything specific in the kingdom of god at this time that's the kind of conquest we need we're invincible we're unstoppable, we're unbendable, we're unbeatable, unconquerable, invincible conquest through loyal manliness. Let's come to number one. Number one, I'm looking at indispensable courage for a life like Britain ministry. It tells us in chapter one, verse six again, be strong. And of your good courage. For unto these people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give to them. Then in verse 7, the first part, only be thou strong, only be thou strong and very courageous look at three things here number one number one we're looking at the characteristic characteristic courage in living for a mission you're not just living you're not just you know one day to the other and there's no mission there's no commission there's no purpose there's no goal there's no destination. You just leave. It's like a man that is just driving. Because he has fuel in the tank of his car. Just driving, driving. He passed by the checkpoint. Then he drove. He passed by again. And he stopped him. He said, you passed this way before. Looks like you are just going on and going on. Where are you going actually? I don't know. I just like to drive. Just like to drive. It's not driving anywhere. It's not booming anywhere. It just likes to drive. There are people like that. What are you living for? I don't know. I just like to live. What are you laboring for? I don't know. I just like to labor. What are you? What are you aiming at? I don't know. I just like to have a movement. Movement. I get up and you know, I want my blood to circulate. Because of that, I'm here and there. You must have a mission. It's that mission you're living for. That is where we can identify and measure your courage. Karasariki courage in living for a mission number two, cultivating courage in laboring for the master. Cultivating courage in laboring for the master. Number three, contagious courage from the leadership to the membership we're looking at number one there number one there is the characteristic courage in living for a mission now understand joshua had the mission defined joshua had the mission described joshua had the mission delineated he had the focus here is what you are to do you are to take all these people every one of their tribes in Israel, take them to the promised land and have a hedge around them. They will not go back to Egypt. Don't we have a mission? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Don't we have a mission going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Don't we have a mission teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have 
commanded you and it takes courage to be able to get to all these Pharisees, all these Sadducees, and for Peter, that a little girl, a little maid has, you must be one of them. I said, no, I've never known the man. He didn't have the mission to testify of Christ. He didn't think of the mission to exalt Christ and to say, yes, of course, if you look at all the leaves of the apostles, I am number one there. I am with him. I am for him. And I live by his grace. But at that time, uh, he didn't have all it took to be able to stand firm, courageously on his mission. Are you like that? The Lord has called you. And then when you are challenged, where do you stand? Who do you stand for? And what do you stand for? You're saying, um, um, and you become an instantaneous Tamara. Why don't you say, yes, I belong to Christ. He died for me. And he died for you too. He saved me. And he will save you too. The Lord grant us the courage to live for a mission in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. In Second Timothy chapter 2, looking at verse 1 there, it says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 2, it tells us in verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me. The things, Timothy, that you have heard of me, Christ came to this world to save sinners. You had that of me, go and tell them. And he said, Christ has died for us, so that everyone that names the name of Christ should depart from iniquity. Timothy, did you have that for me? Go and tell the people. And then he says, everyone that will live godly will suffer persecution. Timothy, did you hear that from me? Go and tell the people. He said, all the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, don't edit it, the same don't adulterate it. The same, don't diminish it. The same, don't add the tradition of your tribe. The same, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You see the four generations there, Paul, the apostle, and then you have the Timothy generation, and then you have the generation of the people that, uh, you know, Timothy will teach and train, and he'll go out and say the same thing and then you have the final generation the people that those people will teach it says as we pass it on from generation to generation we pass on the watch of the gospel the salvation the sanctification the strengthening the empowering in the holy ghost and the whole scripture the entire revelation of the mind of god of the message of christ and the entire revelation of the ministry of the holy ghost the courage to take on to that and the courage to live for that and the courage to spread that and the courage to make sure that we saturate the whole land with the entire and the full gospel of the Lord. Then he says in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, Thou therefore endure hardness, endure hardness, endure hardness. Every profession demands hardness. You know, we go through the training period and sometimes, let, let's say for example, uh, those who do medical work, doctors, in their training, you know, there are times that during the time of the training, they will spend hours Many people spend just about eight hours in, you know, in the office, in service, they resume at uh, maybe eight, and then they close at uh, four or five, uh, to short time. Those uh, people who are training to be able to help people in their health. 
Sometimes they will spend 16 hours. And it's a miracle that they'll not be dozing while they're examining the patients in their training. And sometimes they'll be on call. They just finish now and they call them, come for this emergency. There is hardness. And then think about those who are into engineering, fabricating this, fabricating that. And sometimes some of those machines, if they're not careful, they could, they could risk their living. They could risk anything, hardness everywhere, even our women who get pregnant and, and they deliver, um, you know, kings and princes and presidents of the future for them to deliver such a children, boys and girls, they had to endure. A hardness. Look at the athletes, and they're running, and they want to get to the Olympics, and they say, "That's my goal. That's my mission, and that is my drive for them to get to the Olympics." They have to deny themselves. They have to watch their diet. They have to watch their strength. They have to watch when they wake up and when they sleep. They have to watch the time of practicing. Sometimes they have to punch all those bags. Everyone on earth, if we're going to do anything meaningful, we have to understand there's hardness, there are difficulties, there is a real thing that demands your strength, and we endure. And for the minister, for the one who is going to stand for the Lord, criticism will come, and then there will be misunderstanding, misrepresentation, a lot of things will come, and you have to endure hardness. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, he tells us in verse 4, in verse 4 he says, No man that worries and tangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Some things you loved before, some things that were part of your life before, like a soldier, he cannot hold on to what civilians hold on to if he's going to have real success and victory on the battlefield. The same thing with us as good soldiers soldiers of Jesus Christ he says we're not entangled we're not encumbered with the affairs of this life that we may please him please him please him now you cannot please him and please the world at the same time and the world they have different kinds of music and if you dance to the music of this part and the music of that part and the music of that part you soon grow lame because it's not easy trying to please the world and then self also demands you please the flesh pamper patch the flesh but you cannot because the one who has called you is Christ and if the flesh demands anything that is different from what Christ our captain Christ the conqueror Christ the foreigner what Christ demands we must say no to the flesh and no to the world and no to the devil that ye may please him who has chosen you to be a soldier you'll please him in Jesus name look at verse 5 in verse 5 Five, and if a man also strive for masters, if a man also strive for masters, what do you strive for? Are you striving for mastery as a pastor? And you want to be a master pastor? Are you striving for mastery in soul winning, in evangelism? Are you sharpening your skill? In evangelism, if a man strives for masteries in evangelism as a teacher, a teacher of the word, are you striving for masteries so that you take the word, analyze the word, break down and bring together again in a constructive manner because you are a teacher of the word and if you are a counselor, are you counseling in a way that you are striving for masteries? If you are doing church planting, are you doing that and you are striving for mastery? Are you leading any group of people as a leader? Are you striving for mastery in our lives? 
in our ministries. What we are to do is to strive for masteries, yet is see not crowned except a strive lawfully. We're looking at number two there. Number two there, cultivating courage in laboring for the master. Cultivating courage in laboring for the master. Uh, uh, courage is like a plant. You have to plant it, water it, fence around it, make it grow, tend to it, give it attention, you are cultivating. Look at all them, all the ministers of God. Think about Moses. When the Lord called him, he said, Lord, but you know I'm not able. He didn't have the courage. You have to plant the courage, cultivate the courage. Look at Joshua. Joshua had to cultivate the courage. And then look at David, who am I, to be son-in-law to the king. My family is not known in the land. You have to cultivate the courage. And look at John, John the beloved. You never hear his voice. You just lean on the Lord. But before he died, a natural death, they put him in boiling oil. And yet he survived. All those ministers, all those apostles, they have to cultivate the courage. Look at Peter. Aren't you one of them? Please, don't bother me. I don't know him. Another one came. Your speech betrays you. You're one of his disciples. I said, I don't know him. Another one came the third time. You're telling a lie. I saw you in the garden. I don't know him. I'm not the one that you saw. The man did not have the courage. He could weep. He could cry. He could be sober. He could say, why did I say that? And then he went away and he cried his heart out. But on the day of Pentecost, when they were all in one accord seated, and then there was a mighty wind, and then tongues like a sapphire came upon them, and they began to speak in other languages that they never learned before, and the Spirit gave them utterance, and without anybody prompting him, Peter stood up and said, Ye men of Israel, hear my word, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom ye crucified, the boldness has come. Boldness will come for you. Courage will come for you. But the point is, the urge to cultivate. And you have to cultivate. If you are always uh, reading materials that tell you about bad, bad things, and you are reading materials that tell you that, you know, things are difficult. If anybody survives in this community, it will be an exceptional thing. If that is what you feed upon, you'll never have courage. If the last time before you sleep, Sleep at night, you're reading all the news and, you know, there's a page there of crime, of criminality, of this and that. If that is what you sleep with, there is, yeah, there's no way you are going to have courage if during the day all you see and all the people you converse with are the people that are anemic. They're the people that are weak. They're the people that don't have any kind of inner strength. You will not have courage, but you have to switch over and read about the promises of the Lord a faith in Christ and what Christ will do, what God will do. And you are soaking in and sinking in the promises of God and you are standing on the promises of God and your face around that quarry that the Lord has given you like a plant, like you have to water and you're reading things that will contribute to that courage and your face around so that the things of fear, the things of dismay and the things of difficulty, all those things will not come. Your courage will rise. Even this morning, your courage will rise in Jesus name. A look at Ephesians chapter 6 and I'm reading from verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong 
That's what the Lord said to Joshua. That's what Paul the Apostle said to Timothy. And now that's what he's telling the Ephesians. Be stronger in the Lord and in the power of his might. Look at verse 11. In verse 11 it says, Put on the whole armor of God that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then in verse 12 it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, wicked spirits in high places. Then in verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day you'll be able Amen. i will be able and i've been done all i've been done all i've been done all you do all not a few things of what the lord has committed into your hands not just part of what the lord has committed into your hands i've been done all to stand ready again for any other assignment for the kingdom and then in verse 14 it says stand therefore don't wobble stand don't cringe stand don't collapse stand stand firm it says stand therefore having your lawyers girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness then in verse 15 it says and put on your feet short with the preparation of the gospel of peace verse 16 above all above all all those weapons all those all the ammo what makes them effective is a faith above all taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the furry darts of the wicked verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation that must be there all the time the experience of your salvation the evidence of your salvation the essence of your salvation it says take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god let's look at number three here number three contagious courage from the leadership to the membership it says contagious courage courage is contagious courage will spread from you the leader to the ones you're leading courage from the mother to the daughters courage from the father to the children courage from the teacher to the students courage from the principal to the members of staff courage from uh, the overseer unto the people we oversee. If we have a timid attitude, if we have a weakened spine, if we have a fearful, frightened language, if we have the disposition, the appearance of weakness, and we're like jellyfish, like people who are not good for the land or good for the sea like the birds that the bat is neither part of the birds that fly or part of the uh, animals that walk on for is in between it's despised and they you know the fable storytellers they tell us that's why the birds cannot come out in the afternoon when everybody can see the badge is for the night when he can hide a shame and when he can hide his uh, identity that is not well defined but 
we as the ministers of God we understand when we have courage that goes on to spread to the rest of the people your courage is contagious and fear is contagious cowardliness is also contagious but from today our lives will be courageous our standing will be courageous and the things we do will show that we have met the Lord and the courageous conqueror lives on the inside of us hey, look at you know when they were fighting the battle against the philistines in the time of saul and david saul was the king but he was fearful and that spread to the rest of the congregation of the people of israel saul his knees were knocking against one against the other and all the people even the senior brothers of david that were in the army they were all fearful and they went to hide somewhere and any time goliath came out and he said choose you a man that is able to stand and confront me all of them will go into their hiding because the cowardliness the fear fearfulness and the frightening uh, the, the frightening disposition of Saul went on to the rest of the army but here comes David and he said I'll take on the man oh they said you cannot I will because God is with me look at the man he defies the armies of the people of God of Israel then they took him to Saul and then he um, said uh, let me go I'll take on that man you cannot do it he's been a warrior from his youth and look at me Saul the king of the nation I cannot confront him you cannot you're just a youth he said I can say I can I will say I will I must say I must I can if I can then I will what do I just say in the corner I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in prayer I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in the church when there's no battle when we're singing amazing grace everything is all right I can do all things uh, through Christ who strengthens me if you can come out and do it if you say I can you must follow up with I will I will and so David said I will I will face the man and then Saul said now if you're going to do it he started giving testimony the bear came and with my bare hand I tore the bear into pieces and the lion came and with my bare hand I, I tore the lion into pieces to uh, to defend one of the sheep and so uh, Saul said go and the Lord be with you the Lord will be with you. Yeah. But he said before you go, take my armor. Now, King Saul, the armor that you could not wear, that didn't give you the strength and the stamina, you're giving that to me. He put it on. He said, sir, I cannot go with this. I'm not familiar with this. I'm familiar with the stone. Five stones. One, two, three, four, five. Faith F A I T H Grace G R A C E five. I know about grace. I know about faith. I will take on the man with those two. My faith and the grace of God. I'll finish the enemy. You'll finish the enemy. Yeah. And so he came and when. The Philistine Goliath saw him. He said, look at this boy. He wants to waste his life. All right. If your nation wants to waste your life by sending you forth to confront me, I'll help your nation. I'll waste your life. Your life amounts to nothing. And I will destroy you. 
and David, the bragging of the enemy will not frighten those who are courageous. And David said, you come to me with spear and with sword. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And before Goliath knew what, he took his sling and put one stone out of the five and threw at him and he sunk into his forehead he brought Goliath down we are the generation we are the champions and we are the warriors that will bring the spiritual Goliath of our day will bring that Goliath down in Jesus name now look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 and we're looking at verse 50. It says, so David prevailed over the Philistine with his sling and with his stone and he smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David look at verse 51 it says in verse 51 therefore David ran and took upon and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and were told that he now put up how he put it out of the shield and then it says and thereof and he slew, slew him, Goliath, and cut off his head therewith. Then he says, and when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. They will flee. Amen. Verse 52. In verse 52, and the men of Israel and of Judah, they arose and they shouted, and he pursued the Philistines. They were timid before. The courage of David brought them courage. They were shivering and they didn't know what they would do before. But the courage of David went through to every one of them. And they pursued now until thou come to the valley. And then it says unto the gates of Ekron and the wounded of the Philistines fell. They fell down by the way to Sharim, even to Gaz and unto Ekron. We're coming to the next point here. We're looking here at number two, the implicit commitment to his lasting message. The implicit commitment to his lasting message message we're looking at three things here number one the inflexible observance of the imperishable model number two the implicit obedience to the infallible message and number three the indicated objectives for instructive meditation look at number one Number one, inflexible observance of the imperishable model. We're looking at Joshua chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 7. In verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee inflexible turn not to the left turn not to the right that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest you see the people that overcome and the people that succeed and the people that prosper they are the people who are inflexible this is the way of the lord and they follow that way they're not turning to the right or turning to the left this is the narrow way that leads to life eternal they're not turning to the right they're not turning to the left this is the way of the lord he says stand ye in the way 
and ask where is the good way the old path and then walk in it and ye shall find rest and ye shall find success and ye shall find uh, prosperity in that way the lord has given us the way and the word and the will of the lord and what he wants us to do matthew chapter 28 reading from verse 20 in matthew chapter 28 verse 20 is it teaching them to observe all things we're not turning to the right or turning to the left we're not subtracting from the word or acting to add into the word we talk on everything because it says teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo i am with you always on the condition that you're not turning to the right you're not turning to the left you observe and you teach them to observe all things whatsoever are commanded on that condition on that ground and on that basis lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world and the people of god said amen, amen. look at number two there number two there we're looking at implicit obedience to the infallible message infallible message you cannot find fault in the message there's no error in the message that's why the bible is the infallible word of God. It is true from cover to cover. The part you understand is true. The part you don't understand is true. What do you understand about that? Because God himself, God the most high, God the high one, he, when you say something, you may not understand everything. It's like you, uh, you know, our child in the primary school and the professor high, high, higher than that primary school child, boy or girl, the professor has written something and the primary school child tries to read and tries to understand and the child said, I don't understand this, prof and what i'm reading i don't understand is not true because i don't understand primary school child don't say that that because what the professor has written you don't understand therefore it is not true that's like us in the primary school in the kindergarten of knowledge that's like us men of yesterday women of yesterday a primary school kid in the things of the spirit we read what the most high has written and we read what the god of heaven has put down there and because i don't understand uh, that prophecy i don't understand that prescription i don't understand that precept then i say it is not true human beings cannot tell god that what god has written and given us is not true we have implicit obedience to the fallible message coming from the Lord. Look at Joshua chapter 1. We're looking at verse 8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Of the 66 books of the Bible, at the time of Joshua, only five had been written. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And everything is the book of of the Lord after those five now we have Joshua we have judges now we have Ruth we have first Samuel second Samuel first King and second Kings and first Chronicles and second Chronicles and now we have Ezra Nehemiah and we have Esther we have Job now we have the Psalms now we have the Proverbs now we have Ecclesiastes and now we have sons of Solomon now we have it's been everything is being completed now Isaiah is now there Jeremiah now there and now we have the lamentation we have ezekiel we have daniel and we have all the minor prophets we have matthew mark luke and john acts and romans until revelation now it's not limited to the book of the law it's not the book of the lord the book of the lord from genesis to revelation everything has been given to us now and the way we understand this the book this book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth. Then it says, But thou shalt meditate therein. 
day and night that thou mayest observe to do observe to do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and thou shalt have good success amen, amen. in the book of the lord you'll discover the way to be successful and the way to be prosperous and the way that the work of the Lord the ministry will prosper in your hand in Jesus name number one observe number two obey observe to do don't ever say I can't do that that's impossible you are charging God with being unreasonable that God will demand of you observe to do and then you tell God back and you say God why are you telling me to do that this is impossible no man can do this you're charging God with ignorance he tells you to do something and then you say it cannot be done repent Lord it cannot be done Restore, make Christ your life. The things you're stolen from other people, you take and then give back to the people you stole from. Lord, it's impossible. Be righteous. It says, the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, superficial, external, that will not cut it. That will not make it. And then you say, Lord, to have inner righteousness transparent righteousness righteousness everywhere and every time you say it's impossible you're judging god or being a task master who knows that it is impossible impossible to repent impossible to make restitution impossible to be righteous how do you judge god like that this book of the lord shall not depart out of thy mouth it says his word is that so shall a man leave father and mother and be joined to his wife one one wife and they two shall be together cleave together until death do them part you say impossible you're charging god with being unreasonable and now you make yourself the king uh, sitting on the throne you say god get out of the way don't tell me one man one wife i will dictate what we have to believe no this book of the lord check up your lifestyle check up your behavior check up your character check up your life if it doesn't match with the word you need to come back to the word because this book of the lord shall not depart from thy mouth now out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh if it's not in your heart it will not be in your mouth if it's not in your mind it will not be in your mouth if it's not to depart from your mouth it will not depart from your heart it will not depart from your mind if it is not in your life in practice it will not be on the pulpit in preaching it is what you do it is what you observe it is the righteousness in you it is the holiness already in your heart already in your life that will come out in the pulpit you see this book of the lord shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night you are not meditating on the dogma of any denomination you are not meditating on the ideas of the community you are not meditating on the bad news you are reading in the news media you are meditating on the word of the lord day and night and then it says that thou mayest observe to do 
You're not just a person that knows Bible. You embrace the Bible. You believe the Bible. You live out the Bible that you may observe to do according to all that is reaching therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Amen for everyone there. This work of God will prosper in your hand. The ministry will prosper in your hand. When you make the book of the Lord, number one in your life, number one in your decisions, number one in the demonstration of the possibility of doing the will and the word of God, when you make the watch of God, when you make the Holy Bible, the very center of your life in living personal life family life ministerial life when the book of the lord is number one you must prosper everything that hinders prospering in the ministry the lord will take away out of your path in jesus name and you'll have good success I will have good success. What's good success? When the word you preach enters into those teenagers, boys and girls, and their lives are turned from evil to the goodness of God. When you preach the word and those sinners, they come and then that word you preach leads them from darkness to the light. When you preach the word and that word you preach, it takes the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter, the prodigal wife, the prodigal husband, who has run away from the family and they bring, it brings them back to the good path and the good heritage of the Lord. That's good success. When your word is preparing people and your members and they are passing on from earth to the other side and you go to visit them, they say, thank you, Pastor. When I was on earth and because I'm crossing over now, your word prepared me. I had salvation and the joy of salvation is in my heart and I'm eager now to go to the other side I will see my savior who you introduced to me I will see my sanctifier whom you introduced to me and he cleansed my life and what joy they cross over to the other side that's good success when our lives prepare people prepare them for heaven and they're happy as they're going because the watch of the lord has been in your heart in your mind in your spirit has been in your personal life in a practical way and has come out of your mouth on the pulpit in preaching in soul winning and the people you are preaching to their lives are turned around for the better good success let's come to number three here number three here we're looking at number three we're looking at the indicated objectives for instructive meditation the indicated objectives for instructive meditation it says in joshua chapter one reading from verse eight this book of the law this book of the lord shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate thou shalt meditate now the human life is always talking that's what is called self-talk when you sit down alone by yourself your mind cannot keep quiet it's talking to you and your mind can talk about anything things to even things that had happened 30 40 years ago your mind will just bring it back to the surface and then uh, the mind has a way of controlling what you meditate on and then sometimes an event that happened uh, that caused injury that caused discouragement and something that happened that made you fearful and the mind will bring that up when you're alone by yourself even when you are hearing other people talk something will come uh, from your mind and they give you the substance to meditate on and they give you the subject to meditate on and 
as your mind will pull that out of the archive archive of your life and will pull this up pull this up pull this up it will make you to start thinking of this and this and if we're not careful our lives will go in the direction of those things our minds are bringing up and we're meditating on them but if you take control it's like a teacher that comes to the class and he stands there by the chalkboard he doesn't say anything the students will begin talking if you don't the teacher start talking uh, and uh, focusing uh, on the schedule of teaching for that day on the syllabus the curriculum uh, then all those uh, young people they start talking talking and before you know what they're taking over the class if you don't begin to bring the word up in your heart what to meditate on the words to meditate on and the practical things to meditate on your mind will be bringing all those things and you're meditating on them today and when you wake up tomorrow if you don't have any meditation by yourself then all those things will come up again and they keep on bringing in from your archive from your bank they begin uh, you know bringing ideas that's why many lives are just like that insipid no progress because your life depends on what you meditate on but the lord said beat the day have the victory and be the one to start meditating and to say that the promise of god dig it out meditate on that that's the precept of the lord dig it out meditate on the on that that's the prophecy of the word heaven and earth may pass away but this word a prophecy a promise a precept will never pass away bring it out dig it out and meditate on that that's why it says look at this book the book of the lord and look at the promises there and look at everything the commandments there and look at the compelling force that we have there and meditate on them day and night that's what makes us succeed you will succeed i will succeed look at someone we're reading from verse one someone verse one blessed is the man of course blessed is the woman blessed is the person that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor seateth in the siege of discomfort have you noticed there what happens to us in life you know you are walking and then you see a person who is ungodly and you're walking for them blessing doesn't come that way and there are many ungodly people around us everyone but he says it's when you identify before you walk with somebody identify you see godly you see ungodly you see righteous you see unrighteous you see feet for the kingdom you see on feet for the kingdom blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of, of the ungodly nor standeth when we're walking and walking or the ungodly the next step will be we we'll stand with the people who are sinners we've been walking with them now we we'll stand for them we even stand for them we don't stand against them because we've been walking with them and then it says no seated in the siege of this comfort before long walking standing we now sit with the scorners. But the man who will know my life is precious. And the ungodly will not dictate the direction of my life. The sinner will not dictate what I stand for and what I stand on. And he says the scorner will not determine the siege on which i sit look at verse 2 in verse 2 but 
his delight is in the law of the lord and in his law does he delight in his law does he meditate day and night you can't do that when you are walking with the ungodly you can't do that when you are standing with the sinners you can't do that when you are sitting on the seat of this corner but your delight is in the word is in the law of the lord and in his law do you meditate day and night then it says in verse 3 in verse 3 and he shall be like a tree planted by the waters by the rivers of water that bring get forth his fruit in a season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper amen, amen. whatsoever he doeth shall prosper there are people they do nothing i walked you know on sunday i was in the morning service then we had evening service and because of those two times morning and evening monday i have to rest i do nothing if we do nothing nothing will prosper whatsoever he doeth shall prosper do nothing nothing prospers and then on tuesday i have to relax because i labored so much I worked so much, I exercised myself so much, and I did so much, I went so far. That thing I did on Sunday, on Tuesday now, I need sightseeing. I just need to relax and my nerves will, you know, get down and my nerves will come to the right place. On Wednesday, they still do nothing. Because now, I'm waiting for Sunday will come again. And all through the week, they do nothing. And it says, whatsoever he doeth, you do nothing, nothing will prosper. But when you rise up, and when you say, this is the day that the Lord has made, will be glad and rejoice in it, will be glad and labor for the Lord in it. You're always on the go. And you know that on Sunday, by night, Monday, what am I going to do? At the end of Monday, what am I going to do on, on Tuesday? On Tuesday, where am I going to go? There's evangelism there, there's counseling there, there's visitation there, and there's writing there. There's replying uh, the emails that have come. All oh, you're busy every time. And it says, whatsoever he doeth, what he does according to the word of the Lord, what he does in the strength of the Lord, what he does by the spirit of the Lord, he is not an idle servant, idle laborer, is doing something for the propagation of the kingdom of God. Whatsoever you do will prosper in Jesus' name. Let's come to number three now. Number three, we're looking at the invincible conquest through loyal manliness. Manliness. Now, that means you're bold. That means you're courageous. That means you're irresistible. That means you stand with your backbone set. You're not wobbling. You're not cowering, you're not cowardly, you have manliness. And then your manliness leads to loyalty. You're loyal in your manliness. It's not that you're using your strength against the watch of the master, against the work of the master, against the will, the way of the master. You are manly, you are courageous, you are bold, and then with loyalty. What does that mean? It will make you invisible. 
That word invisible means unconquerable. That means unbeatable. That means unbendable. That means uncompromising. That means you are able to stand and you are literally, literally by the highest power of the enemy camp, by the champion of the Philistines, you are unconquerable, invincible conquest through loyal manliness. Look at Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Amen. Amen. Look at that before I go. Whithersoever thou goest. Joshua understood. Whithersoever thou goest is not to go to Egypt. That one is settled. Whithersoever thou goest is not to turn to the way of the Red Sea. Whither thou goest in the perimeter of the possession that I have declared unto you. When it says, Whithersoever thou goest, the Lord had told him already, From this river, river Euphrates, until the end of the land that you are to conquer in that territory in that perimeter in that circle and circumference whithersoever thou goest in the place in the way in the field that i have sent you it says there you will prosper you'll prosper in jesus name we cannot prosper in a nightclub he has not sent us there we cannot prosper in the Habali shrine. He has not sent us there to go and do their thing with them. We cannot prosper in the field of false doctrine. No, he has not sent us there. In the place he has sent us, it's with us so ever. He sent us and we go there. There our success will come. Your success will come. You must succeed. You must prosper. Going in the way and going to the place that the Lord has sent us, you will prosper in Jesus' name. Three things here. Number one, we're looking at the command to faith on the field. Number two, our confidence in his faithfulness on the field. Number three, uh, the conquest and the fortress on the field. Look at number one. Number one, the command to faith on the field. You say, Pastor, is that correct English? The command to faith. Doesn't, shouldn't we say the command to the faithful? Hold on. When God talks, he doesn't talk to our doubt. He doesn't command us on the basis of our doubt. When God talks, he doesn't talk to us. He doesn't talk to our fear. He doesn't say fear. I tell you, make this man, make this woman a success. He doesn't talk to fear. When God talks, he doesn't talk to our negative thinking. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, says the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways higher than your thoughts and your ways. He doesn't talk to our human thoughts. He talks to our faith. He commands our faith. And whatever, if what God gives you a command, you have to have faith to receive that command because it is to your faith He is talking. Number one, the command to faith. The faith you have when you get on the field, on the field, remember, it's not talking to your doubt. It's not talking to your fear. It's not talking to human thought. It's talking to your faith. Now he tells him, and he says in chapter 1 verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong 
and of the good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee. Amen. Amen. The Lord is with you. Amen. When you understand that you are a favorite of God, I am a favorite of God. I can't hear you. I want you to think of Joshua. I want you to think of the high priests. I want you to think of the priests in Israel. I want you to think about everyone in Israel. And you compare Joshua with one, two, ten, a hundred, a million. He, in the sight of God, was the favorite. Because everything God wants to fulfill for Abraham, his friend, will depend on the attitude and the activity of Joshua. And so, Evan was always checking up on him. Evan always talking to him. And God always alerting him and getting his attention. And God always interacting with him. Always passing all the grace and all the strength that he needed. Always passing everything to him. Heaven's favorite. When you come on the field and you're willing to do and you're eager to do and you're steady and you're willing in doing what the Lord has commanded you to do you'll be a favorite of God Amen. a favorite of heaven and then he'll be able to talk to you and say I am with you and every strength you need every grace you need I will give unto you and with you with us so ever thou goest look at Jeremiah chapter 1 I will read him from verse 7 Jeremiah chapter 1 we're reading from verse 7 it says but the Lord said unto me has the Lord spoken unto you personally have you heard the watch of the Lord the promise of the Lord have you seen the power of the Lord and he singles you out and speaks unto you Jeremiah said the Lord said unto me say not I am a child for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee and whatsoever I command thee, God can only speak to the faith of Jeremiah. He will not speak to his fear. I'm a child. I'm ignorant as a child. I am weak as weak as a child. I am fearful as a child. I'm frightened by the things that happen around me. He cannot speak to your childishness. He can only speak to your faith. And he says to his faith, and you are to accept, embrace whatever he says to your faith. Whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Joshua did it. Jeremiah did it. I will do it. He speaks to your faith. And with faith, all things are possible. Look at number two there. Number two there. We're looking at the confidence in his faithfulness on the field. His faithfulness. What he has said he will do. And what he has planned to do. Understand? Understand. This going to Canaan. Overcoming all the Jebusites and the Canaanites and the Hivites, everyone, all those seven nations stronger and mightier than Israel. Now, it's not starting with Joshua. God had told Abraham that land. Well, you see, look at the stars. That's how your children will be, your offspring. And look at the land as far as your eyes can see. All that have I given to you and your descendants. And then he called Isaac 
I seek. This is not starting from you. I give it to Abraham, my friend. And my friend is now with me in heaven. And everything is right here with me. He can see and he can look whether I'm fulfilling that or not. Everything I promise I will give. He said that to Jacob. And then to all of them, and he said that to Moses. And all those uh, patriarchs and prophets, they were now with God in heaven. His faithfulness to them, his faithfulness to the nation of Israel, that's what gave Joshua confidence. God will not disappoint them. He will not disappoint me. The same thing with us is giving everything to his son. Jesus Christ, ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance, and thou shalt rule them with the rod of iron. It, it's not starting from us, it's starting from him. And because he cannot be unfaithful to his only begotten son, that's why everything he has promised we can have confidence in his faithfulness when we are on the field and the Lord will fulfill his good word in every life in Jesus name have not I commanded thee to take the covenant that I gave unto Abraham Isaac and Jacob and to push that forward and you go and possess the land as I told them, as I told them, as I told them, his faithfulness, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage when you know that what Abraham had been promised, Isaac had been promised, and Jacob had been promised that God has singled you out, that you are the one to make that happen. You'll be strong. You'll be courageous. When you know that what the Heavenly Father had promised and given unto Jesus, our captain, the conqueror, the captain of our salvation, the one that conquers every power, he has now chosen you and raised you up to go make that happen. And he says, I'll be with you. It will give you confidence. In his faithfulness, as you are on the field, he tells us, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, and be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever ye go. Go ye, ye go. Go ye. I can't hear you. Ye go, go ye. You will go. And everywhere you go, you'll prosper. You'll succeed. In Jesus' name. Look at number three. Number three. Now. Praise the Lord. Number three is the conquest and the fortress on the field. The conquest that he sends us for. And then we conquer. You will conquer. We're still coming back now to that Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. It says, have not I commanded thee. You know, in life, commandments come from different directions commandment sometimes your mind will command you please sit down you're running too fast if you go now i will not go with you and so most people listen to their mind weak mind they listen to their mind ignorant mind they listen to their mind the unwilling mind that the mind is saying please please you are driving too fast you are running too far we'll not go with you now because mind our control all the rest of your body your members we will not go with you but you must understand that the god of heaven 
is greater and higher than your mind. Whatever your mind is saying, the Almighty God is saying, have not I commanded thee? Sometimes it's the people around you. Because, you know, nobody walks alone. And, you know, you're running and running and running. And the people around you who are supposed to run along with you, they say, you overdrive. You're a workaholic. It's too much. Now, okay, keep on running. We're sitting down there. And with the sitting down there, they're commanding you. And they're saying, slow down. This is too much. And if you don't know the higher one, the higher personality, and the great God of heaven who has commanded you, you see, without them, I can do nothing. Even if Christ is there, even if God is there, even if the creator of the heavens and the earth is there, without him, without her, I can do nothing. And see, they are commanding me to sit down. I sit down. There you are. That's what every Dick and Harry does. But when you understand that God says, Have I not commanded thee? And he says, Go. And everywhere you go, like I've sent you, you're going to succeed. Sometimes it's society that commands us. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, did we not straightly command you that you should not preach in this name, but you feel Jerusalem with your doctrine and then if they were like ordinary people if they were like the run and mill people oh we're well, sorry sir we we'll forget please don't be angry please don't vex with me as you have said now we're going to see there are people in the command of society they're leaning to but the almighty God said have not I commanded thee be strong and of a good courage Amen. Amen. Be not afraid. You're on the battlefield and the enemy, the enemy people, they are armed to the teeth. And now if you're afraid, they already see that you are fidgety. You don't know even how to use the weapon you carry. If you're afraid, you're down. You're gone. When you come on the field, on the field of preaching, on the field of evangelism, on the field of crusade, on the field of pastoral ministry, when you've come to the field of the apostolic ministry, you cannot be afraid because the Lord is with you. He says be not afraid neither be thou dismayed. When you are dismayed you are confused. What do I say? How do I say that? What direction do I go? What's number one? I've forgotten. What's number two? I for you're confused because you're dismayed. But when you know that the Almighty is with you, when you know the King of Kings is with you, when you know the Lord of Lords is with you, you will not be afraid. <laughs> say, I will not be afraid. I will not be dismayed. I will not be confused. Your mind is set on what the Lord has called you to do. You will do it in Jesus' name. For the Lord thy God is with thee. Is. Present tense. Always. Is. Present tense. Is before you. Is behind you. Is above you. Underneath you are the everlasting arms. It surrounds you. Like the mountains surround Jerusalem. So the Lord will surround the people that love him and their own errands for him. I want to assure you as we're uh, finishing, uh, having this final message today. And you're going back to the field. And you're going back to the ministry. And you're going back everywhere you go. The Lord will go with you. Yeah. The Lord will be with you. And everything he has called you to do, no matter how difficult, he will do it along with you. And they went forth preaching the word and the Lord walking with them with signs following according to his word. The Lord will walk with you. And signs and wonders and miracles and healing and conversions and salvation will follow your ministry in Jesus' 
Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and claim what the Lord has promised that he will do. Let's rise up and claim that on the field we can have courage. On the field we can have confidence. On the field we can have conquest because the Lord who has sent us is with us. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Accept that standing on the promises of God.